So Susan and Pano, thank you very much for that discussion. We're now going to move on to um, the reach of Asian finance. It may well be the only, or it may not be, but it may be the only session today not sort of focused on decarbonization. So it's nice to get back to uh, the marine money bread and butter. Um, we have as our interviewer, um, Sung Juan Choi, SD Choi, a partner at INS. And on the panel, we have Shi Lei, Senior Executive Director, FPG AIM. Carol Rader, who's Vice President, Commercial Europe um, for Bocom Shipping, based out of uh, Hamburg. And we have Neil Skovdal, who's Partner and Managing Director of UK for North Cape. SD, please. Thank you, Kevin, and to Marine Money. Actually, on a personal note, um, after 20 years in Asia, primarily with Korea and Singapore, also with participating with Marine Money in Asia, finally, it's nice to be here in London. Um, it's been a wonderful session, great discussions. And um, yes, I think, Kevin, you're right. Our discussion and the topic is a little bit left or right of center of what the current theme and uh, focus has been the whole day today. But um, we will also touch upon um, the topics that have already been discussed. But before I introduce my esteemed panelists, I just want to set the background. Um, well, I, I'm sure the reach of Asian finance is now a little bit in the past because I, I think we've reached. Um, and you know, I think my panelists are a testament that they're also here in Europe and in the UK. Um, but just stepping back a little bit, despite the, the lingering pandemic, and obviously with, in Asia, you still have the, the zero COVID policies that's um, in China, and then the recent um, geopolitical um, issue. Um, I'm an optimist, and I think in shipping, we've always had to be optimistic even in, in the past um, gloomy, day, gloomy years, the past few years, where the shipping industry is looking really attractive. One, to lend, and more so since the global financial crisis. And we saw last year the ample liquidity rush washed into the shipping industry, generated by very strong sectors, um, container ship and bulk carrier markets, combined with certain less, and I think it was Murray Money that uh, mentioned this, with less fiscal and monetary policy. That reaction has led to robust bond issuance, prepayment of expensive debt, asset inflation, and attractive terms in refinancing. So ship owners are likely to be asking for a lot more of their ship financing source. With that in mind, no one can argue the fast and inexorable growth by the Asian banks, Chinese leasing companies, and Asian originated arrangements and funds, and alternative financing and structures such as Joko in the shipping field. So with that in the backdrop, um, I'd like for each, each of you to just quickly um, just give a brief introduction to yourself and to your organization. Maybe we'll start with Niels. Yeah, sure, thank you. Thank you very much, Hesti. And I think you're right, Kevin, this is probably the first topic uh, on the agenda without the, the green element, but uh, as, as they said, we'll probably touch up on that as well. Can't get away from it. Um, yes, I'm Niels Kordal. Uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, I, uh, I'm a partner with North Cape. Uh, we're an arranger of uh, capital for the transportation, infrastructure, and energy sector. Uh, we've been around for, uh, for 10 years. We had our 10-year anniversary earlier uh, this year. Uh, and in that space of time, we've uh, raised capital for around $20 billion worth of uh, assets predominantly on the, in the shipping space. Carl. Hello, my name is Carl Rader. I'm a vice president with Bocom Leasing. Um, I'm based here in Europe. We are one of the leading uh, Chinese leasing houses, um, active throughout all segments of uh, the shipping industry. Um, mostly with a focus on very strong counterparties, either on the industrial side, so cargo owners, end users, or really first-tier um, ship owners um, with preferably a backing uh, of a time charter. 
Um, we have today a portfolio of about 15 billion um, run out of Shanghai and Hamburg. Um, we own about 420 vessels and we're trying to invest about 3 billion per year. Yes, Shirley. Uh, uh, I'm Shirley, working from FPGA. Um, we are basically uh, the international marketing team for FPG, which is the uh, largest uh, Joko equity underwriter uh, from Japan. Uh, for those who probably uh, are not familiar with Joko, it is uh, a tax deferral driven lease product uh, with 100% financing and very competitive uh, 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 pricing. Uh, for IPGM, it is uh, incorporated in 2012. Uh, over the past 10 years, we have arranged uh, uh, over 14 billion of uh, vessel and uh, aircraft Joko for FPG, out of uh, which about 9 billion that is uh, uh, in uh, shipping uh, in the maritime space. Okay, I, um, I, I'll raise to each of you, and I think with Sheila as well, you start, um, if, and I think maybe you've touched upon this, but if you could share the highlights of what um, FPIG AIM has done the past 12 months, and um, where you are with your portfolios, and when, I, when I'm saying portfolios with um, Asian originated funds with, let's say, non-Asian owners, and any key success factors to the financing in Asia that you bring to Europe. Yeah, okay. Uh, for the past uh, you know, year, I, I think uh, after uh, COVID uh, broke out in 2020, uh, I think the, the Japanese equity market uh, show its uh, resilience and we uh, continue to close deals. And uh, probably you can see from the uh, uh, Money Money deal of the, award, uh, deal of the year awards, I mean, we, one of the landmark deal we closed uh, uh, last year that was uh, 2.3 billion uh, new bill financing for C-SPAN uh, with uh, ECA backed Joko. I think that is the first uh, first time ever uh, in the shipping space. Um, of course, from our uh, perspective, in the past, uh, we try to allocate our uh, capacity 50-50 between shipping and aviation. Of course, during COVID, then the focus uh, uh, was uh, uh, on maritime assets uh, predominantly. Of course, uh, for aviation, we still do selective deals, uh, but for shipping, that has been the real uh, focus uh, over the last uh, uh, two years. I think Joko itself is a, is a credit-focused product, uh, given where the market, uh, shipping market was uh, over the past uh, one year um, and a half. I think uh, the, uh, the, uh, the credit uh, profile of the, our main shipping clients have remained strong, and of course, for us, it was, uh, there was also uh, sufficient capacity out of Japan to underwrite the Joko uh, financing to provide uh, 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 strong and competitive financing solutions for our clients. Yeah. yeah. Carly, yeah. I'm both calmly seeing you. I know you've been very active. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think for us, um, I would actually enlarge it a bit. The, the past two, two and a half COVID years have been uh, twofold. The, the first half, the beginning of COVID, has very much been marked by a series of refinancings with uh, owners that were trying to generate liquidity through um, sale and lease backs of fleet, where they took out part of that bank debt and refinanced on a higher LTV level in order to generate liquidity reserves. That's very much what has been driving, say, the first half of the COVID crisis. Um, then with markets actually turning out to be more resilient uh, and then later going up uh, in a substantial way, it has changed quite a bit because people have grown in confidence. It's something that we saw actually not only on the ship owner side, but a lot on the charter side, on the end user side, and have started picking up the fleet renewal programs again, a lot looking into more environmentally friendly vessels. And that's really what has been uh, coining the past, say, 12, 18 months of our work. It's really fleet renewals of uh, industrial clients that are looking at alternative propulsions and, and more modern vessels. And that's really what we've been active uh, in the past year. Yeah. Niels with North Cape. Yeah. Uh, unlike these guys, we actually don't sit on the portfolio, but, uh, but we still do transactions, thankfully. Uh, in the last uh, 12 months, uh, we've... Uh, close transactions, speaking purely on the shipping side, for around 30 vessels. Um, that's been, uh, I think we did 15 or 16 of them in, in China and nine in, in Japan. Uh, and uh, the balance was done through uh, either European financiers or, or financiers in, in Taiwan. Uh, I think on, on the transactions we've done overall, 
uh, we've probably done around 60% in China. Um, I would say probably 30% in, in Japan. I mean, China has always been one of the biggest part of our business. Uh, part of that is, of course, that we, we started out in China. Uh, we were one of the, the companies that started bringing the uh, leasing companies to, to European and uh, American ship owners. Uh, but also, of course, uh, the Chinese has been able to lift slightly larger transactions compared to, to the Japanese. Yeah. Well, thank you. And um, Asian financing, and in particular, Chinese leasing companies are willing to take some risk that traditional banks and, you know, I think we've, you know, we've known the retrenchment of the, more of the Europe, the traditional European banks the past few years are not able or willing to take, especially when it comes to financing technology related risk. And also as shipping is fragmented, so are lending options to smaller companies. So while small ship owners have typically opted to raise um, funds from alternative sources of capital at higher cost, um, if I could raise a question to Carl, you know, from the Chinese leasing, the type of structuring and the terms and conditions and pricing, what are Volcom um, able to work with and to offer and what business models or asset class are you looking for in your clients' projects? Yeah, I think on our side it is quite focused on, um, on say, the first tier of the market. That is driven on the one hand by the budget that we have and that we need to invest and by a team that is fairly lean. Um, that means that we're focusing on big tickets with strong counterparties. Um, we would also look into smaller transactions, but this would really need to have a component that the relationship can grow. I think that's, that's clearly a focus. And I think that's what differentiates really the, the two of us here. I think in terms of client profiles, we're quite similar. But I'd say for everything below 70, 60 million, there's a high likelihood that you would offer a better tr um, transaction or structure than we would, because we're really focusing on, on bigger tickets these days. And I think that would also tie in naturally with the, the yards, the new building orders, and working with, um, like, Shelley with FPAG AIM, with, let's say, Korean yards, Korean ECAs, and arranging um, some type of structure in, in the Jokor arena, arena, where I think, um, like Carl said, you're you very similar in the type of um, asset class and um, structuring type. I think for us, um uh, uh, we are, how to say, we are uh, focusing on across asset classes. Of course, I mean, there are difficult uh, difficulty in terms of crew tankers. Uh, in terms of asset uh, age, of course, new build financing, that has always been uh, uh, more favorable from, the, from a local perspective because of its uh, special tax uh, treatment. Uh, in terms of client profile for us, uh, we do focus on uh, top tier names and that is important for the Japanese investors. In terms of uh, 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 transaction ticket size, I mean, we can uh, uh, go down our uh, single transaction size to probably as low as 30 million transaction, we still look at it. But of course, from an efficiency point of view, um, you know, especially with the, with the, with the clients that uh, uh, we target, and then, uh, a transaction uh, of sizable volume that we can also be that can also be supported from uh, from our perspective. Yeah, Niels. Yeah, I don't I don't think I'm much add, to add to that. To be honest, I mean it's uh, it's quite clear um, what these guys are saying, and, and we see exactly the same with the companies that we are we're working with. Uh, I mean there are some differentials between the the Chinese leasing companies and the Jolco Rangers. Um, I think it's fair to say, uh, without upsetting you too much, Carl, but uh, uh, the, the Japanese market is probably the cheapest. Um, but of course, you're trading away a little bit of the flexibility uh, compared to what you can get with, uh, with the Chinese leasing companies. And of course, also, there's a little bit more flexibility in terms of asset types in, in the Chinese market. I think, you know, just getting more now to the, the center of like, the, the theme of this whole day is, um, Carl, how do you see Volcom in assisting and arranging with your clients for 
green shipping in the ESG equation? Yeah, um, well, we take the perspective that really this green transition is something that needs to be driven by the industry, not by the financial. That being said, we, we firmly stand by the client in order to finance them. And that's really the stance that we have been taking and that has been driving our, our business the past, uh, say, 12, 18 months. Um, because we've seen that with, with shipping companies or industrial companies, uh, shipping departments, generating more cash flow again, there's been a willingness to invest. And on the back of this, we've been financing a lot of vessels, uh, specifically new buildings. Um, with alternative propulsions and more green um, features that we have done in the past. So in that sense, I would not say that we are the ones that drive this transition. We're standing by the client, but we see it as, a, as an opportunity that we're taking today to help these clients uh, fulfill that transition. Niels, what are you in, in assisting or arranging with your clients? Yeah, I, I, I can only mirror what Carl is saying. I, I, I tend to agree with, uh, with you there. It's, it's ultimately not necessarily the financier's responsibility, but the financiers can, can of course, assist. Uh, and where we can play a role there is, of course, trying to get the financiers comfortable with, with arranging finance for these new features, this new technology uh, that's coming on stream. Um, it's, uh, I mean, we heard on the panel previously that it's not, uh, that clearly the banks are not always there to, to up the leverage, whether it's uh, second-hand tonnage that needs to be uh, refinanced with new features or even for new buildings, which, uh, which comes with additional or new techno technology. So, so that's one of the areas where we're trying to help out to get the financiers comfortable. And we work with the end users, we work with the operators and the financiers to, to get them across the line. Thank you. Um, from our perspective, I think in the recent uh, uh, one year or two, there are, uh, uh, let's say, preference from the Japanese investors for green uh, angle-related investments. And uh, we are actually at the moment finalizing uh, our first ESG link to Jogo as well, uh, where there are uh, certain uh, tr transaction features that is linked to the ESG score of the underlying client and to be linked to pricing of, uh, of the transaction itself. I think, um, uh, of course, we want to contribute to the uh, green initiative in the industry, and we are trying to do our part. Uh, I think one other thing uh, in the Jogo, because there are uh, a strong focus in the new bill financing, so naturally, uh, we are probably closer to the more modern technology, not, let's say, uh, proactively, but uh, uh, just happen to be to be on the uh, greener side of uh, of the of the asset class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's important. And um, each of my panelists and their organization is testament that Asia is so important to the global shipping economy. And for um, non-Asian, in particular, I'll say the European uh, market shipping companies to do business with Asia. And of course, to diversify their financing options to include financing from Asia source. Um, likewise, each of my panelists are organizations that has also looked outwards from Asia to attract new investments and business opportunities with their clients and more by being here in Europe. Um, so if I could just have each of you, your, your thoughts on some of the challenges um, that you may, or lessons learned um, since, let's say, for example, Carl Volcom coming to, um, to Europe. Yeah, I think by today we, we have established ourselves in the market. We have, we have found our place. I think we found the sweet spot where we can grow. Um, looking at the challenges ahead, um, I think the whole green transition offers more of an opportunity to us. I think what is going to be interesting uh, in the coming year and what is something that all leasing houses will have to address is that when you look at those portfolios that have for most of them started to be created in the early 2010s it's pretty much the first time that we are running into a red hot market and it's going to be interesting to see how the different players are going to approach that um, because we see inflated asset values and 
as a leasing house that by nature is a bit more aggressive on the asset than a traditional bank would be, I think that's going to be one of the main challenges uh, in the current market addressed by us. Yeah. Shelley? Um, I think from uh, Joko as a product perspective, uh, uh, I think uh, Newell just now also mentioned, I think the biggest challenge for us is the structural flexibility because it's a tax-driven uh, uh, product, so it has its uh, competitive advantage on pricing, but uh, we lose out on the structural flexibility. That is where uh, you know the product itself may not be uh, all-weather product for uh, ship owners, which may have uh, SMB trading activities in mind. So we have to uh, the product will be more suitable for. Uh, core fleet whereby the owners uh, are determined to hold asset class, uh, to hold assets uh, 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 over long term. The other thing is, is also uh, for Joko Equity is a fixed price, a fixed interest rate product. And for example, not until uh, second half last year when the overall interest environment is very low, then for equity, uh, Joko Equity is not as competitive, but now with the uh, the interest environment that is going up, and then uh, the pricing competitiveness of Joko Equity now it becomes uh, uh, more clear. So uh, all in all, for Joko is itself is not a product that is um, um, uh, may not be applicable or suitable for all uh, clients and all asset class. So we have to wait for the suitable assets, the suitable project, the suitable let's say mindset or tr uh, uh, business strategy of a client. So that is uh, probably we just need to be uh, uh, more selective to wait for the right opportunity. Thank yeah. you, thank you. And Niels, I'll help you, let you have the last word. Yeah, um, well, I think in, in, in terms of, uh, of challenges, it's, uh, I, I think interestingly enough, uh, for, for these uh, entities that's providing high leverage uh, financing, the challenge now is actually to get the money out of the door uh, and not being repaid too quickly because uh, certain sectors are making a lot of money at the moment and, and we're seeing uh, a lot of repayments, uh, probably more on the Chinese side uh, because of the structure. Uh, so I think that's actually one of the, the challenges, uh, getting clients uh, interested in, in these high leverage products because what we're seeing uh, from a lot of uh, our clients today is that the focus is very much on reducing the debt and, and uh, increasing the dividends. Right. Kevin, if leave it to any questions yeah. from the audience. We have time for one question, if there is one, please. No? Then just let me ask you about, just a kind of a practical question. With co travel is still difficult, especially to China. How have and how has that affected business over the last uh, couple of years? Uh, Carl and Niels, perhaps? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, Asia, uh, I mean, I spent a lot of time out there and, and, and it was always the way you did business in Asia was very much going, shaking hands, spending time both in Japan and China, getting to know each other. Um, and, and it was a big concern when, when the COVID came and we, we couldn't uh, travel anymore because, uh, you know, what, what would really happen to these businesses? But I think both we've seen that very clearly both in Japan and in, in China that they've adapted extremely well. Uh, Teams or, or Zoom or whatever product you use uh, has become frequently used. We, we do road shows for our clients, uh, and, you know, through video conferences, something we'd never thought we would do three, four years ago. Um, and it has actually worked. Uh, but it takes a little bit longer uh, in the due diligence process. It takes uh, quite a few meetings to get it, to know each other. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's worked surprisingly well. Uh, and SD, just the last one from you. Um, is, is Korea uh, an option, a source of finance for European owners, perhaps? It always will be because of the, you know, because of the yard, really. You know, um, it, this isn't a question that I, I, I didn't raise, but I've been thinking about it the last, I would say, the last few weeks, especially with what's happened in, um, in, in Ukraine, the tragedy there, and in relation to Russia and how we're going to maybe now have to refocus where we get our energy source in the future or what the energy regime will look like. And that's, you know, that's gonna go directly to also the new buildings for these energy transport. And that's where Korea 
will come in, China will come in because of the yards. And you know, I, I, I think um, Sh Sh Chile's um, company, FPGIM, you, know, you, you worked the past, past year with Korean ECAs yep. for um, sizable new building in Korea. Yeah. And that's a combination of Joko and, you know, Korean ECAs. And we'll get there also with Chinese leasing because, you know, you can't, you can't discount what's right underneath your nose where it's the yard and the, the yard is the vehicle that's going to transport um, the concerns that we are, we are facing right now. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.